Delicious co-creators, Lilou here. I'm in Toulouse, south of France, with Neil Donald Walsh, New York Times bestseller of Conversation with God. Hello, Neil. Hello, bonjour. Bonjour, and delicious, lovely, beautiful Barbara Max Herbert. Hello, Lilou. Uh, it's so good to be with both of you, and I'm excited to, to be, that we're all here reunited, south of France. <laughs> yeah to uh, speak about this book, The Mother uh, of Invention, that you decided to write, Neil, that is uh, bringing quite a different writing style and a, and a, and a, and a beautiful way to show humanity w um, this new species that is being born, right? How did you, why did you decide to write this book now, right now? Well, well they, Barbara. They offered me a three and a half million dollars. <laughs> and I said I, I couldn't refuse. So I agreed to write the book. That's, that's all a lie, of course. It didn't, no, no such thing happened. The truth of it is I wanted Barbara's message to get out into the world. And, and it, it's a, really a twofold message. The first level of the message was just the utter synchronicity of life itself. And Barbara's life is really illustrative of that. It talks, it shows when you look at Barbara's life, how one thing happens after another, after another, after another, in a delicious sequence of events that's occurring in all of our lives, if we look at it that way. And so when we began to look at Barbara's life in kind of a backward reel, I wrote the book from, from, uh, from the end to the beginning, really, starting today and then talking backward until the day she was born. And when you look at someone's life in that way, you begin to see how the dominoes fall and you begin to see that all the things that happened in your life, the things you called good, the things you called maybe not so good, every one of them had its right and proper place in the creation of this moment right here, right now. And when you see that, honestly, without getting over poetic about it, you almost drop to your knees in gratitude as you see the construction, the unique matrix mm -hmm. and construction of everyone's life. You just say, my goodness, thank you, God. I see the whole thing now. Mm -hmm. The second uh, message, and a much larger message than that, but an important one, uh, as the first one is, is what's going on in the world right now. And that I'm going to let Barbara talk about that a little bit, but I wrote the book so that I could highlight that that part of, of Barbara's lifelong message. She's had a vision now for over 50 years uh, that is beginning to fuel a new renaissance and a rebirth of humanity right here on the planet. So I know she has much to say about that. But those are the reasons I wrote the book, because mm -hmm. I, I wanted to give voice mm -hmm. to one of the most important voices uh, of our time, sitting right here next to me. And show us an example of what's possible, right? Barbara, what is your experience and what do you see and how did this life unfold and why could this be an example? Well, first I was amazed when Neil said he wanted to write it mm. and I was honored yeah. and thrilled because I just love him mm -hmm. and also that he has such insights into, into God and we had some really fascinating times where we, he interviewed me, and I then began to ask him questions. And he had, of course, the, the, the messages from God, and I realized how similar they were from my own higher self. And it really proved to me the message of conversations with God mm. is that we all are having conversations with God. Mm. And what Neil did was he dramatized it. And he, he played himself as though he was the guy who didn't know and getting these messages. But he's actually the guy who does know. <laughs> <clears throat> and so he and I sat for days in his studio <clears throat> with video. And also I sent him my intimate journals that I never published. Oh. And we really explored... Uh, I guess the depth of my life and it was it could not have been a more extraordinary experience for me and maybe the most amazing part is that he decided to start my biography in the future and he picked the future date December 22nd 2012 brilliant which I have always held as a possibility for a planetary experience of oneness mm -hmm. and wholeness mm -hmm. And when he picked it, I said, Neil, well, we don't know that this could happen. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of specifics in it, which were what we wanted to have happen at that time. And, and he said, it doesn't matter. We're, it, this is your intention. Mm -hmm. And by writing it, we're going to bring more into reality than if we didn't write it. Mm -hmm. And everybody will know that we wrote it before this happened. So I have felt that this biography 
by its intentionality is helping to create what it was that it was writing about. Mm -hmm. Not only, of course, my past, but my future. Tell us what that is. Well, I would say the key experience of my life was what I call a planetary birth experience. And it came from asking a question, what in our age is comparable to the story of the birth of Christ? A child was born in that story. And it was such an extraordinary child that what followed changed the world. So I thought we had a story as great as that if we knew what it was. Of course, Neil and I are very interested in new stories. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so when I asked that question, I became like an astronaut. Mm -hmm. And I literally experienced the planet heaving and struggling and fighting. And then suddenly we found empathy, love, creativity, innovations connecting. And I heard the words, our story is a birth. What Christ and all great teachers came to tell us is true. We're one. We're whole. We're good. We're born. Now, when I got that, I felt it in my body. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an external experience. I was and am and we all are actually members of this body. This is not, it's not a, um, just a metaphor. Mm -hmm. But because I felt this oneness, not only oneness, but the uniqueness of every part of the oneness, that is to say every single human being and all the new innovations, I felt it, what it feels like when the planet as a whole comes together. And my <clears throat> guidance, I got my vocation, is Barbara, go tell the story of the birth of a universal humanity. Now that was 1966. So with Neil, with his brilliance and intuition, mm. <clears throat> chose that event happening real time in December 2012, which was a recapitulation <clears throat> for on a planetary scale of something that many of us have felt. This is not like a unique thing for only me, because it's actually true. <laughs> we are all members of one body. And we hope, I felt, that by Neil's writing it, with Neil's power of communication and person, that it might actually be an instigation of the birth for humanity. Mm. And since my life is dedicated to that, coming together with Neil it was a force of creation for me, truly, mm. a blessing beyond, beyond. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a coming true. It's a, it's a, not a conclusion, but a new chapter opening up, doesn't it? It must have feel, felt so amazing to work together, and to. So did you had some new realization and some new understanding, or some new things that you would like to share with us that you didn't quite get before you wrote the story and put it together? Is there something else, a new understanding, a new, a new thing that got you really like, wow, is this is really happening in the world? I don't know if it was a new understanding, but I think it was a reaffirmation mm -hmm. of an already held truth. And, but I think it was a rearticulation of it. What was new for me was Barbara's uh, intuitive declaration, her intuitive clarity, the way she held the whole experience and the way she phrased it as a rebirthing or a, a, a actually a birthing of humanity. Uh, and 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 the, her mm. her analogy of talking about the whole human experience from the beginning of time until this minute as really a long period of gestation for a species newly emerging into the cosmic community of sentient beings and to view it that way to see it from that perspective I think was new for me yeah. and to be able to look at it that way and go isn't that interesting that you know, when you think of how old the universe is, mm -hmm. just the universe, trillions and trillions of years old, and then how old our, our particular solar system is, billions of years old, and then how old our planet is, millions and multi-millions of years old. <laughs> and then when you think of all of that, and, and then based on that, how long human beings have been in existence, it's just a tiny, tiny, minuscule fraction of that overall time, which would make us, in fact, tiny, tiny babies. And we've and seen on that kind of a scale it's possible to view humanity really as having been truly in its own gestation period, now being birthed finally and at last, 
and 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 uh, this period of time holding such significance then for our entire species i think that was a new point of view for me i hadn't quite seen it in quite that way mm -hmm. and that is a story that, that that magnificent story of the birthing of humanity is every bit as magnificent as the story of christ it's every, every bit as significant as well and i think that 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 the uh, coming of christ and as a as a um, salvific figure in human history was a presage to this. I think it was, in, in fact, um, a, a, an announcement of what is to come. What is possible. And not, of what is possible. And I think that his consciousness, the consciousness of Christ, was also a prediction of where humanity would wind up being at this point in time. Mm -hmm. we, we are now doing many of the things mm -hmm. that Jesus predicted that humanity would do. Healing, communication. Exactly, exactly. These things and more, he said, ye shall do also. Why are you so amazed, he said. You, 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 you will do these same things. But, of course, at the time he said it, no one could imagine open-heart surgery and implanting, you know, the, all the various wonderful, uh, you know, devices that our medical science has given us, much less, forgetting about even the physical side of it, much less the mental and spiritual development that human beings would experience at this point in time. I think he saw all of that, as have all the great sages and saints throughout all of history, one of whom is sitting right next to me here, uh, on this park bench in Toulouse because uh, because Barbara has had these kinds of understandings and visions not just in the past two weeks or the past two months or the past two years mm -hmm. when everyone else has been getting excited about 2012. Mm -hmm. Barbara's been talking about this for 50 years mm -hmm. in these terms. Mm -hmm. So this is a time of uh, great, I think, opening for all of humanity and we need to listen to people who have had that kind of insight for a long time, people such as Barbara. That's why I hope that all of those folks who have not yet read um, The Mother of Invention will give themselves permission to read it because it's more than Barbara's story. Mm -hmm. yes. It is in fact the story of humanity at this epoch, at this era, at this particular point in time when we will in fact be at last birth. Mm. Barbara, tell us the evolution, what the conscious evolution that we go through as human beings to now birth this new, uh, human, this new humanity. Well, I think we're very fortunate to be alive exactly now mm -hmm. in the 13.7 billion year <laughs> history of at least the, explo the original flaring forth that created this universe and our planet and life on this planet. It took this many years to create a species barely awakening mm. to the fact that it is an expression of that whole process of creation mm. and that each of us is creative with that, mm. as that, and that millions of us are awakening to that right now. The change in, in just my life being 82 years old, mm. when I started out, I never met one single person like me. No one. At, in Connecticut. <laughs> There's a great book in that. Great book title. No one in Connecticut. No one in Connecticut. You know, at the PTA, at the Church Women United, at the General Federation of Women's Clubs. And, and I went to Bryn Mawr College. I really tried. But I married... <laughs> Everyone who went to Bryn Mawr really tried. I went to, You know, I, got, I, I, mar I met my, my husband at a little cafe in Paris, it's Chez Rosalie, and I was asking everyone, what's the meaning of our new power that's good? And nobody had a clue, but he did. He said, I'm an artist, I'm seeking a new story commensurate with our power, and if we don't have a new story, and if we don't have a new image of humans, it's exactly Neil's question. If we don't have a new story and a new image, not the culture and life itself won't fulfill itself. And the artist has to find this. Well, look at this. Here, in a way, is an artist. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very amazing, synchronistically, that he, at this point in his life, is asking exactly these questions mm -hmm. and saying to humanity, if you don't answer these questions, it doesn't really matter. You're just going to stay sinking here. <laughs> so uh, he must have picked me because the questions that I was motivated by are surfacing mm -hmm. in Neil's work. I mean, he's passionate. You heard him staying there. We, <laughs> wh why is it that billions of people haven't gotten what we want because we haven't really asked ourselves the right question? He speaks of our new cultural story. 
he speaks of uh, our relationship to the story being absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. So I gave 50 years of my life mm. because, I, I mean, I believe in questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I think that's one reason I'm so mm. interested in, in what Neil's doing right now because when you get a question deep enough in your soul that it moves you, you can't get away from it. Oh. I couldn't get away from the question of mm. the meaning of our power. Yeah. And when I asked the meaning of Christ, what, what was comparable to the birth of Christ, mm. I got an experience comparable to our power. Yeah. And, and I want to share just a really brief anecdote from Barbara's book that touched me deeply. Mm -hmm. She told me her story, uh, and she told me that one of her moments of awakening in her life was when the atomic bomb was dropped on, on yes. Hiroshima and, and, and Nagasaki. And she was, you know, a young woman at that time, 15 or 16 years old, and she was just aghast and at the power of that and at the purpose behind it. Like, like any 15 or 16 year old person would would think, you'd, you'd look at it and go, why, why, you know, why are we doing this? What, what is this about? And and, and later on in life, by a, a, an extraordinary set of circumstances, she had an opportunity to meet then President Eisenhower. And uh, that's another whole story how that happened. But there she was in the White House, mm -hmm. in the Oval Office with President Eisenhower. And she asked him, she said, you know, Mr. President, may I ask you a question? And at that time, she was a bit older, in her early 20s. And the president said, well, of course, young lady, what, what would you like to ask? And she said, well, Mr. President, what is the meaning of our power for good? And he just, his face went blank. <laughs> and he just looked, up, looked a little off. He looked at her and he said, I don't know. Now, when the President of the United States says he does not know what the meaning for good is of our enormous, immense power, that would set you off, if you were Barbara Marks Hubbard, on a lifelong quest to find out, well, I've got to find, if he doesn't know, then nobody knows. I've got to find out. And so Barbara has spent the rest of her life searching for the answer to that seminal question that has to be replied to. We must give a reply. Now, I want to say that I think that life in 2012 and beyond is our answer to that question. Mm -hmm. We are now demonstrating our answer to that question. What is the meaning of our immense power for good? And, 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 and perhaps we'll have the answer for good as well. It would be nice if we did. And, but here's what's interesting about the answer. It's not written in stone. Mm -hmm. That is, we are creating the answer. Right, right. And, and so we, have, we can create it one way or the other. The question then before the house at this point of our evolutionary journey is how shall we create the answer? Yeah, yeah. Barbara, give us the answer to that question that you had then. Well, I was what, would you an what would you answer on this day? Well, the answer is that our species is being born as a co-evolutionary, co-creative species at the dawn of the universal age. We're at the very beginning of the birth. Of, of, of our, I think what the true nature of humans is to be, which is to be one with the divine as creators. Mm -hmm. And that we have been given the power of gods, mm -hmm. little gods. Mm -hmm. And if we're learning to be now divine, good create co-creators, we're at the very earliest stage. I think we can handle all the hygienic problems of Earth. We're, you know, restoring the environment, feeding ourselves, taking care of the basic needs. We have the capacity when we're connected, but that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I personally feel, it was something in Neil's, one of his books that I loved, about highly evolved beings, Hebs. And which book was that, Neil? Book three. Book three. The highly evolved beings uh, are beings who it seemed to me we were becoming, if we get through this. And I'll tell you really a, a, a personal secret now that I'm 82 and been living this for a long while. I'm really excited about that. I'm not that excited about all the hygienic problems. Hygienic is like a baby's born, it's got to breathe. It's got to nurse, it's got to eliminate, and, and, and it has to have a mm. bassinet. Mm -mm. But you don't say, oh, that's it. Mm. <laughs> You say, oh, that's the beginning. the beginning. And you need to do the beginning. But I think for the human species to have the energy, vitality, and enthusiasm to go through this beginning and do a lot of hard work, 
that we need to be uh, having some impulse that makes us realize we're just beginning. Mm. And like a mother will t do anything for a baby because she knows it's going to grow up. Mm. If she didn't think it was going to grow up, <laughs> I don't think she could stand it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we're going to grow up. Mm. And I feel, as an 82-year-old, very new. Because it's not that I'm growing up. I think I am um, going through metamorphosis, which is a change of form, where I'm noticing that the energy of this impulse creates more vitality, mm -hmm. creates more love, creates more enthusiasm. And sometimes I look at myself and I say, I wonder if I'm becoming a universal human, mm. myself. Mm. Because I've been saying this, mm. and because I'm so old, nobody cares. So, so I'm now introducing myself as an evolving human. <laughs> well, by the end of the video we did in Santa Barbara at your home, you were just beaming with light, and the video definitely captured that. There, You are the incarnation of that on Earth. I'm we can feel norm. it in your presence. See, and what I'm saying, and this is what Neil reflected in the book, I have never felt extraordinary. I have felt normal, but it's a new norm. Mm. And what Neil has been able to do in the book is show anybody who has lived through whatever that that's their particular design. Mm. It's all synchronistic, it's all meaningful. If you say yes to the big question that's inside you, and you're so interesting, Neil, that you're just coming, now, going all around the world asking these questions. How come this is happening? Yeah, I, th I think that the meaning of our power for good is, for, for how I would articulate it, is the meaning of our power for good is that it was given to us by life itself as a tool with which we could demonstrate who we are. Mm -hmm. That the enormous power that human beings and life itself has and is manifested through the human life form is a reflection and a demonstration, a representation, a representation of the power of life itself as it manifests in all sentient living beings as a means of divinity itself, understanding mm -hmm. itself and experiencing itself. Or to put it in simple language, God chooses to know itself in its own experience. And, and we have only just now, with all this power that Barbara was asking about, the power to split the atom, the power at this point to unravel the genome, the human genome, the, the, the power to, to do all the miraculous things that we're doing right now is just a tiny fraction, a smidgen. God says to me, you, you guys, you know, that's just sandbox stuff. <laughs> yeah. you, you have no idea of, you're just barely scratching the surface. Mm. But the meaning of this scratching the surface mm. is to show us what's beneath that. So I think that what's going to be happening in, in 2012, uh, December 22nd and beyond, is we're going to start going beneath the surface to, to begin to first discover, then to experience through our demonstration who we really are. And humanity is going to wake up to itself and say, oh my golly, how could we have thought for all those thousands of years through the Renaissance and the, all that time that went by that that was it? That was, yeah. that was, that was how we weren't even on stage yet. We were just in the wings waiting to play our true role mm -hmm. in the expression of life universally. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's, somewhat, it's just an extraordinary time to be alive. I'm, I'm just uh, very grateful to God to be alive at this birthing moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's a very exciting time to be associated with someone like this as well, who sees all of this and and, and saw all of it so many years ago yeah. and had the ability to articulate it. I first met Barbara 15 years ago, and I just sat there, my first meeting with her, with my mouth dropped. <laughs> How can a person know this and be able to articulate it with such clarity? That experience too, I remember you explaining in our last interview how y you saw it all, really, you lived I it. I, I lived through it and I, I just want to say that being with Neil now, just in this moment, because we, we really haven't had a conversation mm. like this since the book was published, mm. in, certainly in French, and I'm realizing the enormous um, <coughs> synchronicity about us sitting here in this moment right before 2012 because Neil wrote this, and he's going around the world asking the very same questions that motivated me to do this all. <laughs> but talk about full circle, oh, because really? th th this began for Barbara in France, mm. That's right. at, at Chez Rosalie. And I'm going with my daughter to Paris uh, in two days to find, try to find Chez Rosalie. Mm. <laughs>
Yes, and, and France is uh, such a beautiful country with so much heart, yeah. and yet the intellect sometimes is, it blocks the, the, the whole. But I, I, a lot of people say that it will really emerge from here in Europe. Uh, yeah, so there's no coincidence, I think, definitely, we're having think, this conversation see, here. Neil is so well known in Europe. He's well known in Spain. And I, I met with some Spanish people, and they said, well, because Neil is so famous in Spain, if the mother of invention were translated into Spanish, you would be well known in Spain. So I realized that my on entrance into Europe for the planetary birth is because Neil's famous. <laughs> <laughs> and they love him, so they're going to have to translate his book into into Spanish. And <laughs> see, Neil, what you do? Yes, <laughs> it's all part of it really. We, we we laugh at it and we chuckle about it, but there's 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 something afoot here. There's, there's really something oh, yeah. afoot, and there's mischief afoot. Really, a, a glint in the eye of God who said, "Wait until you see the whole pattern play itself out." Because, you know, if I am well known in Europe, it's because <laughs> God chose to have a conversation with me, which he's having with everyone. <laughs> but he understood that I was simply a rascal enough to actually put it on paper and have it published. And whereas everyone else would have probably run from that thought and run from that idea. But I Barbara's next book is The Father of Invention. <laughs> 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 the Father of Invention. But you know what, Neil, I have a suggestion. As you go around asking the questions, <laughs> throw in Barbara's question. Say, you know, I wrote this book and Barbara had this question. What is the meaning of our new power that's good? And that we, Neil and Barbara, um, we've come up with, with this idea that it's going to be a birth where we all get it. And maybe you could drop the seed where you go and sell your book, but give them the clue to the, that at least one other person like you was obsessed with these questions. You know, it might actually help the entire mission as well as make The Mother of Invention a popular book. All of it. All of it <laughs> is possible and included in this world, I feel, in the... In the, in the uh, we. We feel, I feel, everything is connected. Like now it's not, it's not an intellectual thing. We feel it, we know it. And we know that now things are going to go up like vroom because all the, the solutions can emerge from this new species, right, really fast. We're, everything is possible. You see, when you start noticing what's working, <clears throat> instead of noticing everything that's not working, mm -hmm. you begin to see a huge potential everywhere. everywhere. And I'm, I recently met the Vice President of the United States. You know, I ran to be selected as a Vice Presidential Candidate in 84. The first woman. To propose a new function in the Vice President to map, track, and connect what's working. <laughs> well, I got nominated, but of course I didn't become Vice President. <clears throat> so when I met Vice President Joe Biden, everyone was asking him really hard questions. You're like, what do we do about poverty? <laughs> what do we do about China? It's just really tough. And so I said, I have a suggestion. Why don't you start asking what's working in America and tell us mm -hmm. that story too? Mm -hmm. His face brightened. Mm -hmm. He said, what a great idea. Mm -hmm. He said, you know, the president could not be optimistic publicly because if he were, it would mean he didn't understand the problems. But the vice president has an opportunity to go around and say this works and that works. And he started to tell us a lot of scientific um, inventions that he had just discovered and I've written to him Mr. dear Mr. Biden I I just want to tell you I think it would be so good for our country and the world if you actually did that now yes. I don't put a lot of uh, energy in it anymore because I don't think the political system is where the change lies I think it's with the people but anyway I want you to know I dropped the seed with Vice President Joe Biden he's a wonderful man full of life and so many politicians are stuck in a system where they can't be their full potential self anyway yes. because the system is requiring that they oppose and destroy each other. Yeah, it's a very constrictive environment. It's, it's very difficult. And uh, Barack Obama is not the first president, I might add, to take that office and to discover how difficult it is. Uh, and we're saying this, by the way, on Election Day in France. It, uh, yes. Uh, yes. As, as this program is being recorded, the French people are electing their own. Sixth of May. Yeah. They're they're, they're uh, electing their own next president, mm. and uh, so the whole world really is at this point of electing its future, 
in many, many forms, not just politically, but in many, many forms. And I agree with Barbara. The answer is not going to be found in politics, although a smidgen of it will be. Yes. And the answer will not be found in economics, although a smidgen of it will be. And the answer will not be found in education, although part of it will be. And the answer will not be found in spirituality, although part of it will be. But the answer will be found in the whole, in the whole picture and how it's put together and how it's seen as a whole. And that is part of the power of humanity that we are now manifesting, to see the whole picture as one whole hologram, really, and to see how those various elements work together. Barbara has a wonderful 12-sphere wheel that shows exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, and if people would began paying attention to those kinds of models that emerge from minds like this, they'll begin to see that holistic approach that can produce the tomorrow for which we have so long yearned. Yes, you see, when the astronauts saw Earth from space, there were no people in that picture. <laughs> and no boundaries. And no boundaries and no people and certainly no cameras and Internet and cell phones and so forth. I believe I had an overview experience of the people and the Earth as a living system. Mm -hmm which was not visible from the astronauts picture and it's really still not fully visible because so much of it is in the invisible thought realm but I felt and experienced the thinking layer of earth become one so it wasn't only individuals becoming one it was the entire systemic reality becoming one <coughs> Teilhard calls it a noosphere <coughs> a thinking layer and when it becomes one when the heart connects yes. in enough mass of people mm -hmm. simultaneously, our intuition is it shifts the whole consciousness field. It's like when a baby finally opens his eyes and sees its mother. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a mess, it manages <laughs> to breathe and nurse and get along. Well, we humanity have never had this experience as a whole. And what I'm excited about in 2012 is to whatever degree it's possible that enough of us would feel it simultaneously through the heart. Through and their hearts. And they call it heart yes. coherence. And yes. The Heart Math Institute is a whole big project called Global Coherence. Yeah, I'm interviewing Howard Martin next week. They're, they're just doing, and they're a part of our partnerships. Like Neil's work is a partnership with, with this effort. But they have a global care room, and we're calling it a global birthing room. And when somebody registers, a light shows up in the Google map where you are on earth that you just signed up <laughs> so the vision is the earth's going to light up mm. and how many lights does it take to turn the earth on we'll see we'll see <laughs> that's the whole story it, it, it's actually unknown let's all get together <laughs> yes. into one thought what is that one thought that we could all have this is the one thought is that we are one we are one Maybe what would you say then? Uh, uh, that's what I would have said. Uh, uh, the one thought is that we are one and that there's a larger purpose and function to life than we could possibly have imagined yeah. or demonstrated. So that the, the, the really the one thought is there's more going on here than meets the eye. Or as uh, yeah. Shakespeare wonderfully wrote, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Well, what Neil said is so true because there is a type of mysticism that says we're all one and that's it. <laughs> and I'm saying there's all one <clears throat> and now we are arising toward point. more. And there is a difference in spiritual attunement to we're one and that's it, to we're one and now we've begun. <laughs> that's, that's a great little poem. We are one and now we've begun. <laughs> We're nowhere near done. Yeah, that's it. That's There's lots of fun. <laughs> and we're one, Neil. Yes. <laughs> and we're one. And we're one. And I would love to finish this conversation with um, what happened at the Zenith of Toulouse here in front of thousands of people. And you had you were here there on stage. And <laughs> and tell us about the the crying, the connection between the crying and the divine. I think tears are God's laughter. And uh, we've misunderstood the whole nature of life and the reason that we're here and, and what's true about us and what's really going on. And I think in my experience uh, that uh, even when I shed tears of sadness, they're at the highest level tears of joy because sadness is merely an expression of love. And love is the highest expression of life that, that it is possible to, to experience. 
So even tears of sadness are, you know, we are sad because we have deeply loved something or someone. And God smiles, uh, uh, you know, you have to understand this at a very high level. God smiles when God sees people shedding mm -hmm. tears of laughter or joy because they're all expressions of love. And so I think that uh, for me, uh, when I have any tears coming to my eyes, I just let them flow, mm -hmm. whether they're for sadness or for joy, because they're really all in, mm -hmm. I, I, at, at the root cause the same thing. There is only one emotion. There's only a single emotion in the universe, and that's love. Believe it or not, all expressions of life, whether they're anger, even hatred, violence, are expressions of love. Because if you didn't love something, you wouldn't be expressing violence or hatred. Mm -hmm. It's a distortion of your expression of love. But you must love something or you wouldn't care one way or the other and you'd never get involved in anything. So people who even become violent with each other or become angry with each other or express uh, love in a distorted way are doing so because mm -hmm. there's something about which they deeply care. All we therefore need to teach humanity in the years ahead is how to deeply care in a way that reflects caring at its highest level rather than its, at its lowest vibration. That's been humanity's single lesson from the beginning of time. We're now about to learn it and to demonstrate it. See, every act is a call for love. They say in the Course in Miracles, mm -hmm. I mean, even if somebody up there were to hit you with a gun or something, and the, uh, Jerry Jampolsky tells the story of somebody were really threatening him. Now, it wasn't that he didn't have to defend himself, but he recognized yeah. that the person threatening him had a call for love. Yes. Now, just being able to see that at the moment of being threatened was amazing. But uh, it, it's true. Yes. It, it's true, and I do believe that when we have a certain critical mass of feeling of oneness and wholeness, that it becomes easier and easier for people to feel it together. And so the ones who can feel it most easily have a special responsibility to step forward and experience it because they'll be bringing so many other people the most, with them. The most powerful question I ever heard was this. What hurts you so bad that you feel you have to hurt me in order to heal it? Mm, mm, yeah. Well, yeah. That question would change the world overnight. Yes. Guys, I just so enjoyed this conversation. <laughs> My goodness, so much love and beauty coming out of this out of this conversation. I'm so excited to that uh, people will be able to share it too and see it, and it'll go on all those little Facebook page, Facebook, the third country, right? So thank you, and I want you to please remember to say birth2012.com. If anybody wants to find out more, there's a free website for them to check on. Yes. Earth2012.com. That will be the website right there at, at during the whole video. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my beautiful co-creators. Thank you for your love and connection and sharing this video as much as you can. Thank you for your support. I send you much, much love. We send you much love from South of France. Oh, yes. Je t'aime. Je t'aime. A bientôt, j'espère. Un petit je t'aime, Barbara. Je t'aime. We love you. Bye.